Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Roger North of North Drums. Roger, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor to have you. You have been, since the very beginning of me starting the show, one of the guys who I really wanted to get on because North Drums... And, and I'll say, if people don't know what they are, Google it right now, because everything's going to make a lot more sense when you actually see them. They're very unique drums. I'm excited to hear about them. Why don't we just go back and, uh, well, first, how would you describe them? If you're describing it to someone who has no visual reference, how would you describe these unbelievable drums? Well, um, visually, um, they look like, if you if you have seen mostly on older ships and boats large boats the the uh, curved air scoops that mm-hmm. uh, that uh, flare out on the, on the end that sucks in the air they kind of look like that only upside down <laughs> with yeah. the head the drum head being on the small end so they're so they're essentially uh, sort of elbow shaped yeah that's a great description that's uh that's they're they're and 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 it kind of horn like um so that being said, let's go back to the beginning. And um, how did you come up with this? Did you come up with this? Were, were, was there anything like this before? Just take it away. Take us through the whole story. Uh, I did come up with it out of uh, out of nowhere. I never had seen anything like it, or <laughs> and as it turns out, there wasn't really anything like it. But uh, I was was, uh, and I still am a drummer. But I was playing, I was living in Boston uh, after I got out of uh, gr- uh, graduate school, engineering school. I did, graduated as an engineer. And I was playing music in, uh, in Boston and starting in 1967. Uh, I got in a band called Quill, uh, which was around for a number of years in Boston. And we were pretty successful there. And we were... Play, we, we were playing a lot of gigs in 1968, uh, starting in early 1968, opening, and we opened for a, a lot of kind of big name bands. Um, we never really got to the point of being headliners or anything, but we did a lot of a lot of a lot of pretty big shows. Hmm. And in August of 1968, we were op- we opened for the Who in wow. Boston at at the Music Hall Theater which was a pretty big venue. So, you know, it's a converted uh, movie theater, um, bigger than the places w- that we normally had played. And uh, I was, I set up my drums, I was setting up my drums and playing them. Um, and I had my, my original set of drums, which is a s- set of uh, Slingerlands, double, double kick drum, you know, the, the full, full four toms, the yeah. whole, the whole thing. And um, I, was, I set them up, on the stage and then I, I kind of this was kind of before the days of really heavy uh microphone amplification of drums mm-hmm. and uh so i went out into the into the uh, seats to hear what they sounded like from a distance you know and truthfully i was appalled because you know <laughs> everything that i heard on stage these were nice sounding drums too everything that i heard on stage did not get to the audience mm-hmm, yeah. and so so i right then that was that was the moment that i said uh, you know i'm an engineer I, I gotta i can do something about this you know so i just started thinking around with it made a prototype model of a uh, with a 12 inch head turned out to be a, and a horn shape like that i mean somehow i don't know how that came to me it just seemed obvious yeah you know what i want to do is reflect focus and reflect the sound forward to to the audience and you know to the band too but mostly to the audience cuz it it a normal drum sends most of its sound either down or up which is because of the way the heads are arranged and yeah. the way the head vibrates and so I wanted something that would reflect that out into the audience. So I was living in an apartment in Boston, and uh, I basically learned how to use fiberglass because that's, it was really the only reasonable way to try to make something like that. Um, making it out of wood would have been really difficult. Mm-hmm. And so I basically ruined my first apartment learning how to use fiberglass and uh yeah you know i made i made all made the mold myself and uh it was a pretty big drum turned out to be a big drum 
I mean, I think that the open end of it was was close to twenty inches. Wow! Um, and uh, for a twelve-inch head drum, so <laughs> so I made a single drum, and I had no desire. I wasn't really looking to uh, make them as a commercial venture or anything. I just wanted to make. I just wanted to make something I could play that would that would be different and that would work. And I popped that thing out of the mold. Well, I popped it out. I had to destroy the mold to, to get it out. But uh, it was just raw fiberglass. It was kind of this translucent pink stuff, you know. And it wasn't very smooth or anything. It was just re- it was really funky. Yeah. But it looked really good. It looked like a like like translucent uh, giant seashell or something, you know. Hmm. And so visually it worked really well and, and the sound pretty much did what I wanted to. I had to experiment around with heads and things like that. So basically I had one drum and I, I put that at, in front of my, in the front of my, between my other two toms. And, uh, I played like that with it for a while and everybody would, was wowed by it. You know, it's like, what is that? <laughs> and, um, uh, so it, it was great, you know. I, I got a nice reaction out of it. I started, I started fooling around with some other shapes, and then I decided, well, I'm going to make a smaller one. So I made a uh, a ten inch, and then I made an eight inch, and so I had three toms there. And then I said, well, I got to have a kick drum now. So I I didn't really go very fancy with the kick drum because it's it was it's, it's already facing the right direction. Yeah. So the the very first kick drums that i made i made two of them they had 18 inch heads and they were 33 inches long (laughs) 33 (laughs) inches deep they were like shotgun i I call them shotgun kick drums wow 18 inch head the opening was 20 inches because any bigger than that and i was gonna or maybe it was 22 i can't remember but any bigger than that i wasn't going to be able to get it through doorways and things like that really so that that was the first set (laughs) <laughs> well, let me ask you, while we're on the first set, like, so would you just use like, you know, generic lugs or were you like deconstructing another drum set and grabbing lugs and, you know, drilling holes and all that? Well, that was, that was, that turned out to be a really difficult part of the whole thing. You know, hmm. I had the shells, but um, finding the hardware, you know, there was a, there was a uh, good music store in, in Boston called Wurlitzer's. And uh, I went in there and they had a lot of drum parts and things like that. And I just scrounged up any, any kind of lugs and rims that were the right size and, and tension rods and tom holders and things like that. I scrounged around for any used ones that I could find that would work, you know, because I, yeah. I wasn't trying to make it look, you know, commercially feasible at the time. I just sure. wanted it to work. So that was my, that, that's, that, that's, that's what the first drums had on them. Wow, man, they're like, I can't imagine being someone watching you play these at a gig for the very first time and just being like, what the hell is this guy? Yeah. Well, people did that for, for years, actually, because, you yeah. know, they weren't, they didn't get that well known for quite a while. So, no, they're, they're kind of Dr. Seuss ish in a way. They, you know? they, yeah, they have that aspect to them. <laughs> okay. So then moving forward, so you've made your prototype to fill yeah. a need that you had of projection. You're playing gigs still with Quill. Then what happens after that? Well, uh, I played it in, in Quill up through, uh, well, probably early 1970. Um, I, we, Quill was reasonably successful. And we even, in 1969, in August, we played at the Woodstock Festival. Wow. And the original Woodstock Festival. And uh, I had two of those drums at the time. <laughs> That's awesome. I had the, the, the big 12 inch. And I had another one that was this weird, weird, very weird sort of Doombeck like shape only curved. Wow. Um, and they were on, they were on stage. There, there are videos that have that show those drums mm, that had bit. to blow people's minds at Woodstock. Well, Woodstock, <laughs> you know, visually Woodstock was, you know, people were not that close to the stage, you know? Sure. So, so they, they, most, most people probably didn't even notice it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But the other musicians did, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they were, they were aware of it. But so, but so anyway, at, when Quill broke up, um, I spent a year playing with, with uh, a, a, this legendary folk singer, Odetta, 
hmm. from from uh, New York City, and we had a we had a little band, and and the, the the Wild North drums didn't really fit into that concept, you know. So I so I went back to using my Slingerland drums for that year. But yeah. in the meantime, I had gotten a patent on the, on the uh, or I had applied for a patent on the on the uh, concept. Wow, That's and awesome. uh, but it hadn't come through yet. But so I played with Odetta for a year and put up, put the drum thing on hold. And then I, after that thing ended, I, I joined a band called the Holy Modal Rounders, hmm. also also from New York. And they that was they were appropriate for that. They were just like a really very wacky group. So I played my for a while. I played my set with the two giant shotgun bass drums and all that stuff, <laughs> even. <laughs> so so. I went back to playing those drums and we, the rounders moved eventually out to, uh, out to the, to the West coast to, to Portland where I live now, Portland, Oregon. And, uh, you know, we, I still was, I still had really didn't have any idea of making these commercially, although the, you know, the idea sort of crossed my head, but I, I, I didn't really want to be a drum manufacturer. I wanted to be a drummer. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, I never wanted to be a drum ma- manufacturer, or really, <laughs> even when I started doing it. But but uh, at at a certain point, I realized that the round, the holy modal rounders, were never gonna. We were for a while. We were trying to get record contracts and things like that, and and uh, they were successful in their own way, but but not not commercially. Mm-hmm. And and uh, um. So at a certain point, I had a I had a son at that point, and his mom. We were living as a small family, and I was I realized that this this crap is this this is never gonna this is never gonna be a paying gig, you know, mm-hmm. enough to support a family. Sure. And but in the meantime, my patent had been approved. So, and I don't, I don't remember when that was. Maybe in 1971. I I I think I think I looked at the patent recently and it said 1971 so that it was a, that it was approved so so i said why well, yeah, i need to i'm gonna if i'm gonna do something I need, I need to do something with this patent now and so the rounders were down in, in san francisco area playing some gigs and uh i went to a patent library which is in uh what is now silicon valley is down i forget the name of the town but it's down it's down there near near san jose near stanford and yeah. uh they have, there's a whole museum dedicated to patents and all the new patents showed up there and everything. So I went on a, I did my own patent search, you know, and I said, there, there's nothing here <laughs> like this. So yeah. um, then I, I, I went to an, a patent attorney down there and tried, you know, tried, tried to, that I saw an ad for, and, you know, he didn't offer me any kind of a good deal or anything like that. So I said, Oh, well, the hell with this. I'm just going to, go back to Oregon and make them myself. Uh, so uh, that's what I did. And my first, uh, my first installation was in this barn, which had a, it had a concrete floor, but it was a barn. It was a funky barn. And uh, I bought, I bought some equipment, um, borrowed a little money for it and some from my dad and, but almost no money, you know, probably like, three or four thousand dollars all together which let me buy some fiberglass spraying equipment and enough hardware for i think four sets of drums and mm-hmm. and a drum of uh polyester resin and some fiberglass you know so that's yeah. that was what so so i made four sets of drums and 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 but but i i spent a long time making the molds making good molds smooth you know professional looking smooth on the inside which is really complicated to do with fiberglass normally fiberglass yeah. is finished on one side and then the other side the other surface is uh just rough you know but i didn't want yeah. that because on those drums the inside of the drum is actually just as visible if not more visible than the outer part of the shell yeah it's just it's facing you right Right. So I so I wanted that to look good too. So I, it took me a long time to make the drums and, and to make the molds. And I made the four sets of drums and uh, they look fantastic. You know, I mean, people that, that's, that really blew people away seeing them actually look like real drums, you know? Yeah, I bet. Yeah. So 
from there, you know, I put them in a couple of music stores in Portland and I didn't know what to do with them. You know, I'd had musicians from time to time, other drummers ask me about making them. And I said, ah, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to make them. But, but I ended up doing it. And the, the, awesome. the first, the, actually the very first set that I sold, it wasn't even a complete set. It was a set of toms that I sold to a big name artist was uh, to Boz Skaggs out of uh, San Francisco. And he was, he yeah. was, he was playing up in Portland uh, at a Paramount theater, pretty big theater there. And uh, my, my son's mom, I was out of town. My son's mom took, took a Tom Tom down there and to show the drummer who, who, uh, who I knew actually, his name is Rick Schlosser. I, I knew him from Boston, but he didn't, Rick didn't have any money, but Boz Skaggs bought the drums. Ooh, wow, because it looks cool for the stage show. Yeah, right? yeah, and I, he may be a drummer too, I, as as well as a singer songwriter. I I don't know. I I never met him, but sure. anyway, that was yeah. kind of the first the first breakthrough, and then there was a little bit of interest around, and I got back to Portland, uh, you know, a few months later, and uh, Billy Cobham was was uh, just he was he was like going out on on his own with his own band this was after he was in uh, mahavishnu or playing with john mclaughlin and he was he was he had his own band with george duke playing organ and uh i mean billy cobham is like probably the same for most people he is who i think of when i think of north drums first i know tons yeah, of people play well him, that's but- right uh, uh, that's that's what i'm that's what i am getting to you know i yeah, he he's yeah. the, really the one who put it over and i mean i, I can i remember that i went down to the Paramount where he was playing uh, in the afternoon while they were setting up. And he wasn't there when I got there. And I just had a, I had a, like a 10 inch Tom and I just stuck it on, set it on one of the amplifiers upside down, you know, the white one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was waiting, waiting for him to show up. And I I was over on the side of the stage and he came walking onto the stage and he, and he saw that this drum sitting there. I mean, this is kind of an emotional moment almost. Um, (laughs) <laughs> He's, he saw the drum and he looked at it. He says, "What is that?" And he came in and he walked all the way around the amplifier. Looked at it, before he even touched it. You know, he just looked, walked around it, staring at it. You know, and then finally he <laughs> picked it up and hit it with his with his hand. You know, and he says, "Whoa!" So, and then I came over and introduced myself. And you know, long story short, somewhat short, uh, Billy, I I told. I told him I would love you to have some of these drums, but I can't afford to give them to you. And so he bought them. He bought hmm. three toms and took them back, took them out on, I don't know where he took them on his tour with him, went back to New York where he was living, New York city. And things took off from there. I mean, drum stores started calling me and other drummers and, you know, but he's where he's really the one who put it over. Yeah. God, that's set up. Uh, I mean, I think of him as playing North drums and then a big, five set um yeah and yeah. it's just iconic yeah. i mean that is so cool can i ask you while we're on in like from what i can tell from kind of googling it right in this period of about like would you say this is probably mid 70s right yeah yeah what about and i know nothing about them but i'm sure you do um staccato drums yeah they, you know they came out later uh, and I, I heard about it for, for a while. I mean, one of the guys uh, that was working for me one, one day came in and this is, this is well after I had sold a bunch of drums to some well-known people and Billy Cobham included and, and, uh, um, Richie Albright, who's, was Waylon Jennings drummer and, uh, yes, was already using them. And there, there were a bunch of people, uh, yeah. but, but. And I don't remember the exact timing, but well into it, one of the guys that was working for me came in and says, "You know, I saw I saw a knockoff of your drums today, and they're weird. They're weird looking. They have a weird shape. They're not like circular in the front. They have this thing that looks like a nose sticking up." And he said that it's like the, the kick drum looks like a pair of underpants, you know. And I'm going, <laughs> "What? I, I, I can't even picture it, you know." <laughs> it does. But, That's but that, yeah. that that was when uh, staccato. Um, came out with their things and that's that's really all i know about them you know i never i never spoke to them or anything i think that i think it was an english company 
I, I'm not sure. really sure. I, I've, I've seen them on the great website, drumarchive.com, which is a really great resource of like drum catalogs. And yeah. they have a catalog on there. And for people, again, to visually kind of to visualize it in your mind, it's basically a North drum, except it's not round. It's pinched. It's pinched and in the, the front and the open end. Open end. Yeah. yeah. And then the bass drum, like you said, is like, it's got like a line. It's got like a line in the middle and it's basically like a pair of pants. It's like, yeah. a, it's, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> yeah. like, now I can't get that out of my yeah, it's, it's like a <laughs> pair of boxer shorts, you know, exactly. <laughs> it's laying on yeah. their side. <laughs> Well, that's cool that you weren't like, I'm going to spend the next 10 years suing these guys and trying to go after, but I guess it's, it's across, it's overseas. So that's kind of a different, um, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, did, you know, to tell you the truth, I, like I said, I, I was never all that interested in that aspect of business Okay. and, yeah. and doing it's that, you know, it did bother me, you know, I mean, it said, well, oh, man, you know, what's yeah. going to happen here. But, but I just thought, I thought they were for one thing. They weren't, they weren't as nice as my drums because they had this weird, this weird shapes, but they were also not finished on the inside, you know, mm. and, and, uh, from what, from the pictures that I saw, yeah. they were, they were rough on the inside. And I said, ah, oh, that's Mickey mouse. You know I mean? That, that's so I, I wasn't too worried about them. You know, I, I yeah. sort of had the name recognition at that point. And so, yeah, Definitely. so I did, but I didn't want to get into that hole. No. Interesting. I just had to ask cause you see them and you go like, Man, that's that's a ripoff right there. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Well, that was yeah. that was my that was my reaction. <laughs> never actually seen a set. I've only seen pictures of them. I've never seen them either. I have seen North drums like in real life, but I've never seen. Which goes to say that they're probably I don't know the the duration of their company, but they're probably pretty rare. Your drums are rare, but um. Anywho, back to North drums. So um. So in the seventies, things are going great. And looking at the list of stuff, you I mean you got Billy Cobham, you have uh, Alan White from Yes. Like you said, there's a huge list. Yeah. Um, Jerry Brown was playing them with with uh, with David Bowie. Yeah. Um, Doug Clifford from uh, Doug, Creedence. Doug Clifford. Yeah. His, uh, well, actually, Doug Doug Clifford um, was really interested in helping me out. You know, and I I huh. he he bought a, a set that he that he saw down in uh, um, Oakland, I think. And, uh, he, he bought them from the store and he called me up and Doug Clifford was, he was not with Creedence Clearwater anymore. I think they had, they had broken up, but he, he called me up and, um, first thing he wanted was, was, uh, he, he says, well, I want to come up and, and see your company and everything. I said, well, not a lot to see, but yeah, come on up. You can stay at my house. So he came up and stayed at my house for a couple of days. In fact, I think he had a gig up here in Portland with his hmm. with his uh new band i can't remember what it was called but it w it wasn't credence sure but yeah. but anyway i i i um he came up and stayed with me and he came out to the shop and looked at all the stuff and w just he was really nice really good guy and he was very complimentary and everything and and at one point he you know, I was, I was saying, yeah, well, it's, you know, I'm just trying to do what I can. I don't have any capital to work with or anything, you know, so I'm, it's, I'm, I'm kind of getting snowed. I'm, I'm getting snowed under by all the orders and everything, you know? Yeah. And, uh, he said, well, I would hate to see you be undercapitalized, you know? And he was kind of hanging around. And at the time I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. You know, I just, and mm -hmm. uh, looking back, it was probably a big mistake. I probably should have, I probably should have taken him up on it. Meaning take a loan from him or something. Or, 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 or a partner, or. form some sort of a partnership, you know? Got it. I yeah, mean, yeah. It, it would have meant giving up a lot of the rights to the drums. Sure. In which at yeah. that point I wasn't ready to do that because there was still like this huge potential. So I didn't do it. But I did make him a custom set of drums because he was also playing in this sort of more jazzy band and he wanted a, a set of uh, two-headed North drums with heads on the front. Hmm. And I said, okay, I, I'll, I, I'll do that. I can do that. You, it's going to cost you a little bit more money because I have to make special molds for them because it's entirely different shape, you know? So I made him a small jazz set with a, like an eight, 18 inch kick drum and a, one of the drums was a, a, a 10 inch head batter head and I think an 11 inch front head because it had to, I had to be able to get it out of the mold. 
and mm. the other one had a 12 inch head batter head and maybe a 14 inch like actually maybe maybe it was 11 and 12 something mm, anyway there were sure. two two uh sort of tapered elbow shaped drums that i made for doug by hands basically and uh yeah and while i was making them i'm saying well he's not going to have the only set in the world so i also made a set of shells for myself <laughs> which i play now <laughs> that's awesome man God, so there cool. aren't we'll any, and, and I have heard, I, I don't know, I haven't talked to Doug, but I had heard that, that he didn't have them anymore. And so I don't know where his set is. Mm, God, that someone's got to have them. I mean, yeah. y- unless a flood or something happened, but usually, I mean, they got to be sitting in someone's basement and they maybe don't realize the, the history. Or they and got stolen a- or something. I, I have no idea what happened to him, but uh, you know, I've lost yeah. track of him and, and, uh, but, and I just, I don't know for sure, but I was, I had heard someone's, Someone told me that he doesn't have them anymore. Wow. And he was always a famous like Camco player. So I always thought he was just using Camco and I'm sure he used other drums. Well, he, uh, he probably did in, he probably did in Credence. He, oh, he was playing in the, uh, his band was called the Don Harrison band. And I, and I think maybe the uh, bass player from Credence was also in that band. Well, that's neat. Yeah. He's a great drummer. Um, hindsight's twenty twenty. Yep. In the moment, you probably knew what was best at the time and didn't want to give up all of your, you know, yeah, yeah, and, 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 yeah, and, yeah. and really, I, I, I kind of realized that if I did that, you know, being a businessman was going to take over my life. And I was still much more interested in playing the drums than I was in running a drum business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're uniquely positioned because um, people can actually, and a lot of people do this, I think, where they just use your toms and integrate it into their drum set. Yeah. They're like almost like octobons or rototoms where you can you can just slide them in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quite a few people do that because, you know, truthfully, the kick, the kick drum isn't that revolutionary, although, although it is deep, you know, it's, it's 22 yeah. inches deep as well. So it's, it's a, sure. it's, it's a kick-ass drum. It really is. Yeah. And it's fiberglass, yeah. which obviously vibes and Pearl and a lot of companies make fiberglass, but it's, it goes with the whole set. Right. Um, yeah, that's uh, so, all right. While we're in the, you're in business and everything, I mean, I guess not really accounting for inflation and stuff. What would a, a set of North drums cost back in the day? Well, I think, I think they were retailing for like a, like a four piece set, you know, three toms and a kick mm-hmm. drum. They were retailing for somewhere around $700, maybe $800. In I, the I, 70s. Was, I was trying to make them, you know, be, not more, not that much more expensive, th- if at all, than a set, an equivalent set of Ludwig's or Slinger lens or something like that, you know, sure. which probably was you another know. stupid mistake, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want them to be like, I, I, I wanted them to be affordable, you know? Yeah. You, you don't want to s- price yourself out of the market by having a $4,000 drum set that no one can afford. Right. Um, right. Would you... Would they be in every music shop around the country or were you basically like a music shop would call you and order and say, we want to get some of these, or I guess you probably had a distributor or something like well, that. Well, when I was making them myself in, in the uh, barn and then later on in the, and I had to move my shop to an actual bit, little bit bigger shop. Um, mm-hmm. When I was making them, all the orders were coming in to me from, from stores and occasionally from another, you know, from a drummer. But I had to be careful with that because the stores got all freaked out if I sold them direct to somebody. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah. But, but I was swamped and my molds were starting to fall apart. And, you know, it, it, was, it was getting to a point where I was r- worrying about it. And I uh, got connected to uh, a company in Long Island, Music Technology, uh, MTI. Uh, through, through a friend of mine, I, I had, I had a friend down in Los Angeles, a, a woman that worked for, uh, a big time manager down there, Herb Cohen, who was managing, uh, Frank Zappa and, um, mm. uh, a bunch of, you know, sort of oddball people like that. But, but she told Herb about these drums and Herb, Herbie is a businessman, you know, and he came up to Portland and uh, again, toured my shop and everything. And he says, well, you know, I can get you, a, I can get you a contract to, 
to make for somebody to make these drums. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. I don't really want to make them anymore, but I, and I, at at that point I was interested in, you know, he, he was trying to get me a partner and I said, I don't, I don't want to do it. I, what, what, what I would like to do is license them out for some license, the patent to somebody, to some company to, uh, make them and you know market them and do all the all those things do do all the hardware and you know all the other things that are involved in it yeah you know because i didn't want to do it anymore and and sure. so herb had a had a, a friend on the east coast ernie briefel who was the president of this music technology and they had they had some other instruments they had they made they were marketing uh, electronic keyboards and synthesizers for, uh, I think a t- company called Krumar. And they were, <laughs> they, they, they also, they also, uh, were marketing these really high end accordions, you know, but, but Ernie also came out to my house and he was involved with one of the, one of the original, uh, guys, the engineering guy that started five strums. It's, it sounded to me, Ernie was, was in tight with the, this guy from Fibes who had put the whole Fibes uh, manufacturing process together and everything. So, uh, so it seemed yeah. to me, this is the ideal, this is an ideal situation because we've got a marketing guy and we've got an engineer who knows about fiberglass, blah, blah, blah. So mm-hmm. I, I signed a, uh, license licensing, a contract to license the drums, license the patent to, music technology and i i very modestly insisted that they still be called north drums which i think was a good move i think so i mean you can't <laughs> yeah change the name it can it's almost confusing halfway through to be like oh these are now uh south drums or something whatever it's yeah a, a yeah stupid joke but, but anyway yeah. I, I did i did want my name <laughs> to stay with it and yeah. and so i licensed them to music technology and they had a, it took them quite a while to get their manufacturing process down where it was working and mm-hmm. uh but in the meantime billy cobham had had made a they made he paid they they hired billy cobham uh to promote them a little bit and he was on the cover of uh, uh some music magazine i can't remember what it was mm-hmm. music world or yeah. something like that cover of him with a surrounded by a bunch of north drums and uh so cool. so they were doing the, they were doing everything right except that they had manufacturing problems and they eventually, but, but they were selling them. They were marketing, they were handling all the stuff with the stores and everything. And, uh, I was, I was out of it. And then they had so much trouble manufacturing them that they, they, Ernie called me up and he said, you know, what we would like to do is for, we have some, a new, they changed the shape a little bit to make it easier to, manufacture them to make them so that the molds didn't were one piece i my my molds had there were seams in them i had to assemble the molds mm-hmm. so there were yeah, all these, wow. these seams it was really problematic getting the things to look right you know it was mm-hmm. a lot of hand work when i was making them so ernie said would you make the shells if i pay for some, you, you to make the molds and I, would you make the shells just make the shells and ship them to us just make as many as you can you know and I still had my fiberglass shop and I, I said, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So, so I did that for, I don't know, maybe six or nine months, maybe even a year while they were getting set up with this injection molding company in Italy, in Palermo, I think. Hmm. And so that, that there was a period there where I was making making the shells and they were doing all the assembly and that, that kind of thing. And then phase three, they, they started getting the shells from Italy, which was fine. I didn't, I, like I said, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a, a manufacturer really. So I was all for it. And they, you know, and they consult, they did, I did some consulting with them and they flew me back to New York and wanted to make sure that their new shells were okay. That sounded good. And they were, really resonant there and in some ways they were more resonant than the fiberglass drums and they were really strong i mean i he says well do you think these will hold up and i so i took a i think it was an eight inch shell that he had and i threw it down on the concrete floor as hard as i could and it got a little (laughs) tiny you know maybe half inch long crack in it 
Oh, I wow. said, that's I, pretty good. Yeah. And I said, yeah, they're strong enough, you know? So, God. so wow. with my approval and everything, they, they started making them in Italy and it went from there. And was that in Italy with the injection molding, was it like more of a plastic it's, drum? Well, well, the fiberglass is actually plastic too. Okay. A lot of people yeah. don't okay. realize that it's, it's a polyester resin, but with re with fi glass fibers reinforcing it. So it's, so it's, okay. it's not as fragile, but the plastic, the, pla the polyester is not particularly strong itself. You know, it'll crack. I mean, it'll, it'll deteriorate. So, so, uh, so yeah, so it, but the ones in from Europe, I don't know. Ex I think it was a, a high density polyurethane, uh, plastic i don't i don't know what it was but but it was but it was pretty resonant and it was it was uh really strong mm, man is there a way for and we'll get to the very loyal um army of collectors out there but is there a way for people who are collecting these to like differentiate really like okay this is one made in roger's barn <laughs> this is one made by mti this is one made in italy are they labeled yeah. as such at um all? Uh, yeah the, when i was making them in the barn um, the, the label, I had a, a, a round, about uh, maybe inch and a half diameter, maybe two inches. I don't know. A mm -hmm. round label that just said North in the middle of it. And it had the patent number on it. And it had a sort of a thing that I did in my typewriter to, to indent it with a sort of a serial number, which like if it was an eight inch drum, the serial number would be eight dash. 75 or something like that the 75th eight inch tom that was made by me in the ship and and yeah. okay so the label was different the the ring around the the open end of the drum was made of rubber not not uh, i think when when they started making them back in long island they started uh putting a like a it's like a i think it was a synthetic rubber uh kind of rim thing sure, around it and sure. it was sort of welded shut mine were mine were rubber and they were glued and there it was it was actually a hard thing to figure out how to do that and make it stick and it and, and they they do tend yeah. to come off yeah um, but you're hitting the drum and it vibrates and it shakes it's like how a screw always comes off in your damn snare yeah, when you, after you yeah, hit it a bunch yeah. you know but the, the, the main difference really is the ones that i was making in the shop were were longer that you know there were a longer tube and there was actually a section up probably th three or four inches long up by the head that was a straight cylinder. And then it, and then it bent into a tube. So they, those drums would not, if you just made a mold, you could not get, get the drum out of the mold because, it, because of the shape. So I had to make the mold in pieces. And so those drums had both on the inside and the outside had seams from the, from where the where the molds came together and i you know spent quite a bit of time trying to get those sam scenes seems to look reasonable and it, it even involved painting spraying a stripe of new coloring on the outside of hmm. the drum you know so so yeah. you know th that's that's how you tell i mean those are those are the originals okay do you know how many is there a way to even know how many north drums are out there from your very first one to the last day of production. Like I'm sure it's not like Ludwig where there's a million of no, them. No, like, you know, and and I don't I don't know that either. That was that was kind of a, a bone of contention that I had with music technology is they were supposed to every year give me a count of how many they had made and they were gonna they were they paid me in advance, but they were also supposed to against that advance they were supposed to pay me a royalty based on how many they made and sold and yeah. I never got counts from them. And yeah. from, from the time that from right from the very first, they didn't even give me a count for the very first year. So, so I don't know the answer to that, but, but the, yeah. when I had the gotcha. business in the shop, of course there were, it wasn't all complete sets. So there were sort of different numbers of eight inch drums, toms made, then, then there were kick drums made and that kind of thing. So, but, but they were, there were under a hundred, okay. they were, they were all under a hundred. That's awesome, man. Pretty, pretty rare stuff. Um, okay. So 
Why don't you take us, what happened at the end? I mean, I'm assuming, obviously, we're getting close to the end there. They're being made in Italy there. Then um, how did it actually come to an end? Well, um, to tell you the truth, it took so long f- for for the manufacturing process to get to get going correctly um, that the really hot demand that was there in the you know when I did the licensing uh, agreement and when I when I, I was swamped with orders you know I, I couldn't keep up with them not even close and uh, so it took yeah. so long for them to get it together on that uh, on fiberglass manufacturing on that end. And then I was making them for a while and the volume went up a little bit, but it took a long time to get that Italian thing going. And truthfully, by the time they were tooled up to make a large number of them, um, things had moved on, you know, electronic drums had come in and, you know, they, they sort of had lost their, you know, something that looks that different. Take, you know, it has a hot period mm-hmm. and then, then, you know, it's, it becomes old hat, you know, and then a long yeah. time later it becomes vintage and then everybody likes it again, but <laughs> <laughs> now it's cool again. Yeah. So perfect transition there to talk about. There is a world of, um, people who collect them and, and the way I got to you and I want to give a shout out here. Well, first off, uh, our mutual friend, uh, friend to everyone who's plays the who plays the drums, Jim Messina of Vintage Drums Talk, um, has done a history with you and has a great resource. I know he's got North Drums and has done a history of them. But um, there's also a great Facebook group called North Drums. Yeah, I'm pretty, in that. Group. Pretty obvious. You're in it. Yeah. yeah. Of course, you're the pr- you're the king of it. Yeah. Every, well, every everyone <laughs> I found out about it and I and I joined up and every once in a while somebody will have a really interesting question and, and I will weigh in on it, you know. But I I don't I don't I don't I'm not that active in it. Yeah. Just occasional no, comments. Well, there's a lot of people on there and and I said, hey guys, I'm trying to do an interview um, with with someone about North Drums and I had heard of you, but they were immediately like, you know, you need to talk to Roger. And actually it's uh, it's interesting. It's a fella named Daisy Kaplan who is a Cincinnati guy where I live and I've seen him play a few times um, in the band Lung and he um, he plays North Drums. Um, so it was just kind of a weird thing to have still another play, guy. He still who, plays them? I think he has a Tom. I think he actually bought a set. Yeah. And then from looking back at the group, I'm pretty sure he sold some off. And I think he has a pretty small setup. So I think he just maybe kept a floor Tom or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, they've become very sought after. I mean, you don't you don't see him too often. So yeah. when people uh, there's a lot of collectors. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's used to be that I would go to a gig. I would play him at a gig and then people would come up, other drummers would come up and say, God, what are those? I've never seen those before. Those are amazing. You know, and, 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 but nowadays, then, then it became, people would come up and say, oh yeah, those are North drums. My dad had a set of those, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, but, and yeah. now uh, some of the younger drummers are coming up and, and once again saying, what are those? I've never seen those before, you know? So That's it's really funny. interesting over the years, how it's, how it's slowly changed. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, um, yeah, I recommend people check out the Facebook group and, um, just look up pictures of them, try to find them. There's a lot of cool different colors. There's the yellow and the white, and I like how they have the different interior paint. Um, it's really rare to see a innovative product, based around an actual drum shell there's like tons of really cool great small you know different products for your bass drum and for cymbals and everything but you don't really see many things that mess with the shape of a drum shell and i guess another beauty part of it is unlike trixon you don't have to have some funky kind of oblong head that you have to order special yeah you know yeah um, but as I said that, I guess you and Trixon are two of the, like, really I'm forgetting. And I guess staccato, if we want to mention. Them, yeah. Well, are, you know, I, I also remember, um, when I was starting to make them, when, uh, when I think it was, uh, Zikos came out with the, with the clear yeah. drums, which when those came out, I went, Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You that's know? a good point. Yeah. But there aren't very, there aren't, you're right. There aren't that many. No innovative products and all that stuff um now do you have you for fun since when did it end basically the early 80s right uh 
for me, yeah, yeah. I, well, I, for yeah, I don't know when. I don't exactly know when MTI stopped making them. Okay, okay. Have you, for fun, in the last thirty five forty years, gone out and made any North drums on your own just for fun? Mm, no, and you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I did after after I. When I still had my fiberglass shop, I made uh, some uh, conga drums that were hmm. uh, they weren't they weren't as as you might imagine they weren't like conventional conga drums, but they had of but course. they had but they had uh, um, cowhide heads and you know heavy oh, heavy cool. they were hand drums, but yeah. they were they were more shaped like a doombeck. But I made I made some uh, I made some straight ones, but I also made some curved ones uh, that, that sort of they look like a fish, <laughs> you know, because they're they're, awesome. they're curved a little bit and they and they neck down to a you know probably about a four inch opening and then they flare out a little bit at the end. So there wow. there are a few of those. Um, I dinked around with some other little kind of flat shapes that, but that was a long time ago. It's it, fiberglass yeah. is, is not, not fun to work with at all. <laughs> no, I've heard and that. It's kind of dangerous. And I, you know, there's, there are times when I think about some of the stuff that I did and I'm, I'm amazed that I didn't uh, burn my shop down. You know, I'm, I'm amazed I didn't yeah. burn my barn down because I had a, had an exhaust fan that actually had a spark inside of it, you know, <laughs> that I was using to exhaust the, the, the the overspray from my spray booth, you know? So, uh, you know, there are times that I wake up with a cold in in a cold sweat, thinking of all the things that could have gone wrong that didn't. (laughs) So, so in in some way, you know, I, I, no, I don't have any desire to make them anymore. And, uh, you know, my only memories of that are kind of like nightmares. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You know, well, but in the big picture, you're you're a big part of drum history. So I mean, again, it's something yeah. to be proud of. To be and I, you know, and I am proud there. of it. I, I appreciate that, and I my son really appreciates it too. Uh, yeah, his his name is Ty Ty North. So he, okay, he's yeah. a bass player, a very good bass player. He played in a group called Leftover Salmon for ten years or yeah. so. And, um, yeah, I've heard of them. He's he's a really good bass player. But he he appreciates the history of of the drums and the name that that the name is on it and everything too. So yeah, that's funny. He was also recommended to me as an interview guest for this show, but I had to go with the man himself. Uh, yeah, it just made the most. Well, he's <laughs> got interesting sense. stories to tell too, you know, because he was out there yeah. playing around in the shop when I was making them. That's you know, cool. I've got some good pictures of him surrounded by drum shells when he was like two years old. You know, oh, that are nice. pretty funny. So you endangered your own life and your son's life in your, uh, in your I tried dangerous. not to endanger his life. I don't <laughs> think I endangered his life, but I know but, that's, that's funny. <laughs> did you make snares at all? I did. I made it. I, you know, people always used to ask me that, are you going to make a snare drum? And I said, well, I don't know. I just, I just don't know if that's possible, but I, but I did make an el- elbow shaped snare drum eventually hmm. 14 inch. It was kind of big and it had, it, it, it was not a success really because it, 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 uh, you know, the snare was on the head that fa- that was vertical, that was facing the audience, you know, and, yeah. um, it had a really bad, you know, how snare drums will buzz to, because of the, the, ba- the mm-hmm. bass player plays a note and it buzz, it resonates with the, yeah, yeah. the, the drum and buzz it. And, a bass amplifier, most of the vibration is horizontal, you know, and I had mm-hmm. this snare drum that the snare head was, 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 was uh, vertical. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it really resonated a lot from, from the, the bass amplifiers. So that was a problem. And it was, the other problem was it, it there wasn't enough no- sound coming back from the, uh, snare head to the the drummer, you know. So I'm, I could have mm. I could have gone the route of putting another snare inside the top head, you know, like like the uh, a lot of the Scottish uh, marching drums do that yeah. now. But that that, yeah. that was not happening at the time, and I I didn't think of that. Wow, I'm looking at pictures of them right now. They're really they're really cool, but snare drums are just different. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a different beast. It's between 
kind of the way it's set up. It's between your legs and your bass drum is set around it and your, and, and your hi-hat. So right it's right in the like, middle of everything. Yeah. And having this big yeah. snare drum in there was, was hard to work with. Yeah. Yep. I think music technology sold a few of them, but not very many. God, those got to be rare. I'm sure. Yeah. They're, they're, they're really rare. Awesome. Well, um, I usually say, well, where can people find you? But I think the best bet, um, is for people to hop on that North Drums uh, Facebook group yeah. and um, just poke around, and you're around it there every once in a while. So yeah, that's the way to do it. And and I, you know, t- to answer people's questions, I don't have any drums for sale. I have I have a bunch. <laughs> I have some shells in my basement, and I I did take two f- sort of virgin sets out of production when I was when I was uh, making them, and I have since put hardware on them and everything and they're they're really nice but uh i'm keeping those oh man so those are like never released right right one one of them is uh like a burgundy color and the other one is dark blue on the outside and kind of light blue on the inside you know they've got some different hardware on it they've they've got the the rims are not your usual just screw down rims they're they're those floating floating it's a ring with a kind of a floating thing. So it's, yeah. But, uh, Boy, I think you just fueled some more. Uh, that's just now people can dream about those someday, maybe being released yeah. into the world. I, I've and, actually uh, played them out a couple of times, you know, but, I, but <laughs> cool. in general, I, I, I stick with my, the two headed ones that I have. That's funny. Cool. Awesome. Well, Roger, I think we did it, man. I think we've covered the whole history. I feel like I, um, I've just learned so much about these, these just rare and unique drums and, and I'm always on the lookout for, uh, they do come up. I've seen them on, um, here in Cincinnati. I've seen them up on like the Craigslist. You yeah. Know, yeah. They're not that expensive. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm no. waiting, I'm waiting for them to, to, to be like old Les Pauls that are worth like $50,000 <laughs> or something, you know, yeah. then I might sell them. <laughs> yeah. At that point, but that's not yeah, happening. Maybe, maybe so that's, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right, Roger. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and a uh, big shout out to everyone. Like I said, in the North drums Facebook group and to again, my buddy, Jim Messina for just getting the, uh, the fire started for the, uh, you know, yeah, the thirst yeah he's, for he's a great guy. And, and Bart, thank you for doing all this drum stuff. It's, it's, uh, you're making a, a nice contribution to the, to the drum community and, uh, and, uh, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks Roger. Okay. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.